All right, so double angle identities. We're gonna use, we're gonna actually work examples out here. Double angle help, um, same, same way that the other ones help. Like if you were to um, have an angle and you might not know <clears throat> the double angle of it, but you know the half angle, then you could potentially um, plug it in here and then vice versa when we get to the half angles. Um, where doubling it might actually help you solve for the equation. Um, so this is one example here, sine of two, two theta. How did they come up with these? They actually came up with these from the sum and, quote, sum and um, difference. So double angle, they give you the proof down here at the bottom, sine of theta plus theta, sine, cosine, cosine, sine. You end up with two cosine, two sine, cosine. And that's how all of these have come. But the best thing to do is memorize them. The sine and tangent aren't too difficult. The cosine is a little bit more because it has several options. So we have cosine squared minus sine squared. Then we have two cosine squared minus one and one minus two sine squared. And cosine squared minus sine squared is, is the original one and the other two actually come from the Pythagorean identities, replacing one with the other. Um, but knowing when to use those is kind of a little more tricky with the cosine. So with sine, it's easy. Um, if you're just plugging it in, you can choose whichever cosine you want to choose. If you're using it to solve an equation, you're going to want to use the one that helps you the most. So we'll give examples of all of those. So the first thing you want to do is you want to memorize these guys. Because this is, these are ones you need to know. So let's look at how it's used. I will say that the example that they give me is humongous, and then your practice problem is very small. So don't get overwhelmed by the example, because they do give us a huge example here. It says, if sine of theta is negative 7 over 25 on the interval pi, 3 pi over 2, find 2 theta, cosine of 2 theta, and tangent of 2 theta. All right. And so in order to find, basically what they've given us here is they've given us um, our x, our, our sine, which is our y and our r, and we need our x, right? So how do we solve, first of all, for our x to be able to even start this process? If my sign is negative 7 over 25, there's a couple things we're going to say, okay? I know that my sign is negative because, well, they told us it's negative, right? I know I'm in what quadrant? What did they tell me? What quadrant am I in? Pi to 3, pi over 2. You are in the third. third quadrant, right? So that means my cosine is also negative, right, in the third quadrant. And my tangent will be positive, positive okay? Um, I have y over r. Think back from any point on the unit circle. y over r. I need to solve for x, and then I'll be able to give you any trig function you need to, right? So how do I solve for x if I have y and r? Basic theorem that we learned, like, way back in Algebra 1. Yeah, Pythagorean theorem is all you're using, right? It's basically x squared plus y squared equals r squared. All right, so we're going to say x squared, which I don't know, plus what's my y? What's my y? It's negative 7, right? And then my r is 25. All right, your r is always positive, by the way. So I have x squared. Our x is going to equal basically the square root of 25 squared minus negative 7 squared, right? Which is... They give it to you. It's 24. If you don't know, I mean, this is a 7, 24, 25 as a Pythagorean triple, but if you don't know that, just plug it into your calculator. All right? So when you take the square root of 25 squared minus 49, you will get the square of 24. All right? So I know my x, I know my y, I know my r. And they want me to solve for these double angles. And here, you just plug it in. So I'm going to say, if I know theta, I'm going to find the sine of 2 theta by plugging it into 2 times the thine of sine of theta cosine of theta. All right, so I'm just plugging it in. I'm going to say then that's going to equal 2. They already gave me my sine. That's negative 7 over 25. My cosine is going to be x over r. It's also going to be negative, negative 24 over 25. And so I'm going to get 326 over 625. 
25 squared. All right. That is my sine of 2 theta, the double angle. Cosine. It does not matter which one you choose, by the way. Of the three, you can choose whichever one you want. They did, I'm going to show you two ways to do this, okay? They did um, two cosine squared minus one, all right? So they chose that one. So you just need to plug it in. So that equals two. My cosine, we already know, is negative 24 over 25 squared minus 1, which is going to get you 527 over 625. That's your double angle for your cosine. Just plugging it in. Once you have your x, y, and r, you know your sine, cosine, and tangent, right? And then the last one is tangent. There's two ways to do tangent. <clears throat> I already have sine and cosine. What's one way to do tangent? Yeah, they, they show you to plug it into your double angle tangent. Two tangent over one minus tangent squared. That's your double angle. Um, or I know sine over cosine, so I can literally just say, well, it's going to be sine 326 over 625 over 527 over 625. What happens to my denominators? They cancel 326 over 527 is my double tangent angle. Make sense? So you literally just know the formulas and plug them in. So when you go through this and you plug it in, you end up with this positive sine, right? A negative cosine and a negative tangent. If I'm in the first quadrant somewhere, okay, where's my double angle going to end up? If I double this angle, where is it going to end up? Likely in the second quadrant. It's possible it could end up in the first quadrant, yes. Like say it was a 30 degree angle, it's possible it could end up in the, the first quadrant. But it's also possible it could end up here, right? It would never be third quadrant. 
right? Because the most I could have is a nine, an 89 degree point something, right? So the most I could be is just below 180, all right? <clears throat> but a double angle starting in this quadrant will either stay in this quadrant or move to the next one. Now, this guy, if I'm in this quadrant here, we end up with something different, okay? We end up with the possibility of it being likely over here if I double it, right? Because if I have, let's say, a 100 degree angle, right, then that's gonna drop me in this third quadrant, but I could also drop to the fourth quadrant as well. I know I'll never be in the second quadrant if I start in the second quadrant because I'm already past 90, so I definitely am gonna go a full quadrant. <clears throat> so you have to think about that as you're doing these. What quadrant did I end up in? Well, I obviously ended up in positive sine, negative cosine. I ended up here in the second quadrant, right? They have given us this equation, sine of two theta minus sine of theta equals zero. The problem when you have a double angle and an angle together is that you basically have two variables, right? Think of it as X and Y. I mean, if you are doubling what's inside your sine, it's a different angle than what you originally have. And so you want to replace that so that all of your thetas are the same, that you don't have some that are double and some that are single thetas um, when you're solving, when you're solving these. And so for this one, I am going to look at my sine of two theta and I'm gonna replace that. And so go back to your formulas and replace that with what that equals. So sine of two theta is the same thing as two times the sine of theta cosine of theta minus the sine of theta equals zero. And so now I can actually solve this. What method would I use to solve this? What can I do? What do I have in common? So I can factor out a sine, right? So I can say the sine of theta times two cosine of theta minus one equals zero. And then with factoring, I set each factor equal to zero. I can say the sine of theta equals zero and two cosine theta minus one equals zero. So where is my sine zero? on the interval zero, two pi, and actually they have an open interval for us. So that means including zero, not including two pi, which means zero and two pi are the same angle. You don't have to list it twice. So sine is gonna be zero just at what point? Just add zero, right? Cosine is going to be one half, right? That's what that represents at my 60 degree angles, but all the way around the circle. So in my first quadrant, 60 degree angle, that's pi over three. Where is my cosine positive again? Which quadrant? It's first and where's your x positive? Fourth. So that's also at 5 pi over 3. That's where it's going to be 1 half. All right. So go ahead and do A and B. A and B.
So when you look at this cosine of two theta, there's three options to replace it with. But on the other side, I have a sine squared. And so the reason I chose one minus two sine squared is I'm trying to get the same trig functions, right? And so I replaced this cosine of two theta with one minus two sine squared. I just added my two sine squared over negative one and positive two gave me a one sine squared and took the square to both sides. So sine is gonna be positive or negative one. That happens at pi over two and three pi over two. This is why it's very important to know your unit circle, okay? Top and bottom of your unit circle is where that happens. Tangent of two theta, or two beta technically. All right, um, two tangent of beta over one minus tangent squared of beta. Now here, I, what I'm trying to, like, I know this guy is actually going to cancel out. And so I actually flipped both sides. You didn't really have to. But if not, you end up with a one over this one minus tangent squared. And so I flipped both sides. So I flipped this guy and I flipped that guy just because it made it easier for me. You didn't have to do that, but you would end up with one over your tangent, one minus two tangent squared there, or one minus tangent squared. So I um, cancel, then multiply both sides by this two tangent of beta. So it canceled out here and it canceled out here. And as it was left with one minus tangent squared equals one, I added it over. One plus tangent squared is secant squared. That's your Pythagorean identity. Took the square to both sides. So this is where secant is one and negative one. Secant is your reciprocal of cosine. So it's also where your cosine is one and negative one, and that happens at zero and at pi. So there are gonna be times when uh, Pythagorean identity is just brilliant and it helps you get rid of what you need to get rid of. There are gonna be times when it doesn't really help you. And so this is another way to replace a sine squared. So now all of a sudden when you see sine squared, you don't necessarily think Pythagorean identity, which by the way, that is always where I go first because it is the easiest one but you can also replace it with these. And so um, sine squared is one minus cosine of two theta over two. Cosine squared is one plus cosine of two theta over two. And tangent squared, as you would imagine it to be, is basically sine over cosine because your twos cancel. So tangent squared is one minus cosine of two theta over one plus cosine of two theta. If you were to put this sine over this cosine, your denominator would cancel and you would get this. So they always work the same. Tangent's always sine over cosine, okay? Um, they give you the proof, but you don't have to do the proof. I would just memorize these personally if I were you. So let's use it. Rewrite sine to the fourth in terms with no power greater than one. You'll notice we don't have a sine to the fourth, but we do have a sine squared. So I have, I can write this as sine squared squared, right? Does everybody agree that sine to the fourth? And I'm going to replace the inside with what I now know sine squared can be replaced with. This can be replaced with 1 minus the cosine of 2x all over 2. And I can square that. When I square that, I need to square the numerator, which means FOIL. So I end up with 1 minus 2 cosine of 2x plus cosine squared of 2x all over 4. All right. Now, I'm actually going to split this up um, <clears throat> at the beginning versus how they do it because I find it a little bit easier. So I'm going to rewrite all of these as like 1 fourth minus the 2 over 4. That's 1 half cosine of 2x plus 1 fourth cosine squared of 2x. Now, it said with no power greater than 1. I still have a power greater than 1. What is it? What's my power greater than 1? I'm not done yet. What's my problem? This is a power greater than one. So now I need to replace this with my cosine squared. All right? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep the other stuff the same. One fourth minus the one half cosine of two x plus one fourth. And instead of cosine squared of two x, I'm gonna replace it with one plus cosine of two times what's in here. So what am I gonna write there? I'm not gonna write two x, it already is a two x. I need to double it. What do I need to write? Four x 
over 2. All right. So that simplifies 1 fourth minus 1 half cosine of 2x plus. Now, I can pull this, like multiply this 2 and this 1 half, right, which gives me 1 eighth but I still have to distribute it through to both of these, okay? So I end up with 1 eighth plus 1 eighth cosine of 4x, all right? So I need to do one more thing. This is not quite as simple as it can be because I have these guys right here, right? 2 eighths and 1 eighth equals 3 eighths minus 1 half cosine of 2x plus 1 eighth cosine of 4x. They factored out a 1 eighth, which means divide everything by, by 1 eighth, okay, <clears throat> or multiply by 8. So I, I don't think that makes it any simpler, but just so you, I can show you why their answer looks different, so that if, like, for homework, you're like, I got a different answer, they took a 1 eighth out of it. So they pulled out a 1 eighth, which means divide everything by 1 eighth or multiply everything by 8. So they got a 3 Multiplied here by 8, they would have gotten a 4. And then multiply this by 8, they would have gotten a 1. All right, so, but I will take either of these. I will take this answer, and I will take this answer. I don't think one is any simpler than the other to have the 1 8 pulled out, personally. I don't think it makes it any simpler. So you are welcome to leave it just like this, um, which is how I left the practice problems as well. So go ahead and try A and B. B is not the same. You're going to multiply sine and sine squared there. So it's easier, actually, but just pay attention to get sine cubed. I will say that this is one answer, and then if you simplified it by pulling out a 1 eighth, you would have gotten 3 plus 4 cosine of 2x plus cosine of 4x on the inside. The other way to write <clears throat> b is that you should have sine minus sine cosine of 2 theta over 2. 
So either of those is fine. It's the same answer. Four actually follows the power reducing stuff. So follows the ones that we did yesterday. Um, <clears throat> solving an equation. So when you have something like this, you have a cosine squared and a cosine of two theta. You could look at the cosine of two theta and say, well, I could potentially change out and use a cosine. But if you look at your cosine of two thetas here, um, you have a cosine squared minus one. Then you have that one half. So we might, it might cause an issue a little bit. Um, so it's likely easier to replace the cosine squared because then you'll have a two theta and a two theta or a two X and a two X. All right. So you're trying to get one or the other, um, to do it. You may also look at it and say, oh, I could just, you know, move the one half over. You could, um, and possibly factor, but then you probably want to do something with your, um, fraction there because factoring with a fraction is kind of a pain. So, um, there might be more than one way to solve this is my point. The one I'm about to show you is replacing the cosine squared. Okay. So we're going to replace the cosine squared. And what do we know cosine squared is based on our power reducing? Mm, yeah, it's the plus. And so we're replacing just this piece of it with that. And we're going to leave this alone. And actually I'm going to write that as an X cause I didn't recognize that was an X and then equals one half. All right. So Here's the deal. <clears throat> when you have this, uh, I have this two here. I would actually multiply everything by two and just get rid of my denominators altogether. So I would take this two and I'd multiply every single thing by two to get rid of my fractions. All right, and so that's gonna cancel out there. That's gonna be a two cosine of two X and that's gonna cancel out there. So I end up with one plus cosine of two X <clears throat> minus two Cosine of 2x equals 1. All right. So you the front end. Move my 1s over. Those would actually cancel out. So I end up with a 0 over here. And then if I combine these two, I end up with negative cosine of 2x equals 0. All right. Divide by negative, and I get cosine of 2x equals 0. Now pay attention to this particular one. Um. <clears throat> So where's my cosine zero? That's the first thing. Where's my cosine zero? At pi over two and at three pi over two. However, that in this particular thing, that I have just solved for two x. Does everybody see that? My theta or whatever I'm looking for is two x. So that means two x equals pi over two and two x equals three pi over two. So what do I need to do to those to actually solve for my x? I'm not done yet. Yeah, I need to divide by the 2. So that's where they're going to get the pi over 4 and the 3 pi over 4. Does that make sense? You have not solved yet. If that had just been cosine of x, it would have been pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. It's cosine of 2x. So you solved for 2x when you solved for pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. You have to continue one more step and actually solve for your x. Is your cosine I mean, based on what we just did, this simplifies to cosine of 2 alpha, whatever, whatever your variable is, right? Yes. You, you agree with that? Yes, sir. So where's your cosine 1 half? First and fourth quadrant, right? At your 60 degree angles, right? Yes. So at pi over... Three. three and five, or five, pi. five pi over five three. three. So we have just solved for two alpha, right? And then you do solve? Then you divide by two. Six. Pi over six and five pi over six. Again, this is something that, listen to me, memorize. They give you the proof. Don't do the proof. Memorize. I mean, you, but what's good about the proof is you can see where it came from, right? So um, if I replace my cosine squared with my 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2, um, take the square root of both sides, positive and negative here, um, and then just instead of alpha, we're just going to replace it with the half angle. We want to know what the half of that angle would be. Well, my half angle would be this divided by 2, so replace all of my um, thetas with theta over 2. Well, that becomes 2 times theta over 2, which is just theta. So if I'm looking at the half angle, then it's 1 plus cosine of theta over 2. So sine is going to look very much like the other one that we just learned. It's just you have the square root, positive and negative. 
Um, cosine looks just like it. Tangent looks very much like sine over cosine, doesn't it? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll notice they have some extras in here. But I will say, if you find the sine and the cosine of the half angle, you don't even have to memorize the tangent of the half angle. You just put your sine over your cosine and boom, you're there, right? So if you ever forget your tangent of these shortcuts, just at least remember your sine and cosine because if you solve for those and just put sine over cosine, you have solved for your tangent. All right, so let's look at example five. All right, the exact value of 112.5. 112.5 is not on your unit circle, correct? Correct. All right. Um, 225, however, is. All right. So you'll notice that when you get ones like this, if you double it, so 225 over 2 equals 112.5. Okay. And so I can use my half angle. It said they want me to find cosine. All right. So my cosine of 225 over 2, right, should equal the positive and negative root of 1 plus the cosine of my angle, 225, all over 2. All right, 225 is a 45 degree angle in which quadrant? Which quadrant? It's past 180, but not before 270. Third quadrant. So my cosine is positive or negative in the third quadrant? Negative. negative. So I have 1 minus the square root of 2 over 2, all over 2, right? Yes, um, they want exact value, means they want do not want um, you to get a decimal here. So you want to just give it exactly what it is. These are going to look hideous, by the way. So I'm going to get a common denominator up top. Let me just show you what we're doing here the algebra of it. So I have 2 over 2, right? Minus square root of 2 over 2. I just got a common denominator all over 2, right? Um, I'm going to bring it up here. So positive and negative. 2 minus the square root of 2. And it's over 2 over 2, right? Which happens when you do that, you end up with positive or negative 2 minus the square root of 2 over 4. Remember, a root of, I mean, a root of a fraction is just the root of the numerator over the root of the denominator. So positive and negative, 2 minus the square root of 2 all over 2. That's actually my answer. Now, if you plug this into a calculator and you plug this into a calculator, you'll get the same thing, by the way. So you can check your work by plugging in your crazy radical answer, right? And then just plugging in cosine of 112.5 and seeing if your answer is correct. Yes, yeah, so in your calculator, you put square root, open parentheses, 2 minus another square root, 2, close parentheses, close parentheses, divided by 2. Yes. And it So for this one, we have sine squared, and we have um, cosine of a half angle. Cosine squared, rather, of a half angle. Now, just to reiterate, I think we've talked about this before, but I can also write this um, x over 2 and square it like that. Okay? So if I were to do this, 
and write it in that way, then I can replace my um, half angle with my what I know my half angle is. So, all right. And when I square a square root, what happens? It goes away. Yeah, it, it goes away, right? And it actually is going to always be positive. So I just end up with 2, 1 plus the cosine of x over 2. Um, these guys cancel, right? And I have, on the left-hand side, I have my sine squared. And on the right-hand side, I have 1 plus cosine of x. Um, I need to get this in some sort of form where I can solve for it. So I can use Pythagorean identity here. Sine squared is what? 1 minus cosine squared? Equals 1 plus cosine squared. I mean, cosine of x. Um, get your cosines to one side and your numbers to the other. So it ends up being 0 equals cosine squared of x plus cosine. Factor out your cosine. So then, and then set each factor equal to that 0. Cosine of x equals 0. Cosine of x plus 1 equals 0. Cosine is 0. Add pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Cosine is negative 1 at just pi. So those would be my three answers here.